So we're talking about prisons, we're talking about uh, folks returning back to the sky for probation. Most people don't, uh, first of all, my name is Ed Barella, I'm the Assistant Commissioner of the Department of Probation, and I'm our Assistant Commissioner. Uh, I've been with the department since 1989. I've had some other jobs with the county, social services, mental health, etc. Um, when I got to probation in 89, I was one of those vagabonds who went from one job to the other, one year, two years, trying to find my way around, trying to see where I fit in. What I found with the Department of Probation was it is a place where you can do lots of different things. Uh, and I like that kind of being able to be a jack of all trades. We're law enforcement, definitely, okay, but we're also the other side. We provide control, but we provide prevention and intervention. Uh, and that really spoke to me, and I guess it has over the years since next year I've got 30 in. So, uh, great place to work, and it's a place where I think we can make a real difference. Um, most people don't know what probation is, and that's okay. We don't do a really good job of letting you know what probation is. And basically, it's very simple. It's a sentencing option used by the court for certain crimes. That's really all it is. Um, you generally cannot get, as an adult, probation for a B felony, like rape one, but if for a youthful offender, you can get probation for a rape one charge. So there are little nuances in the law. The other thing is most people don't know that there are situations in which folks can come to probation uh, but start their time incarcerated. For a felon, you can get what's called six months intermittent, or we call it shock incarceration. Don't know who came up with that name. So you can start your first six months incarcerated in the local penitentiary, uh, and then do the rest of your five-year sentence um, out with us in probation. If you're a sex offender, that sentence is 10 years for a felony. Same six months though. For a, a misdemeanor, it's 90 days in, then the rest of three years, or for a sex offender, it's 90 days in six years, and for a B misdemeanor, it's 30 days in one year. So there are some reentry issues that we do uh, come up with. Generally, most of our people, the preponderance of our folks, start off in the community. They might be in jail before their sentence, but they start off in the community. Uh, as I said, we are law enforcement, and we're, it's sort of like somebody described it to me one time as social work of a hammer. <laughs> I don't know if that's accurate or not. And our main job, believe it or not, is community protection. That's our main job. Now how we do that is varied. Community protection for us also means providing folks the ability to do better in their own lives, what people call rehabilitation. And let me be clear, nobody rehabilitates anyone else. I cannot control a single one of you in this room. However, we provide <coughs> the milieu, the opportunities, sometimes the mandate, sometimes a little bit of the uh, you know, consequences that might help somebody make better decisions in their lives. That's what we're looking to do. Keep the community safe and also have folks make better decisions in their lives. If I see you on the street after probation, I'll say hi, but I don't want you back in my office on probation committee or crime. We are particularly successful in that. We did a long range study with Iona University and our rates up to five years are down to about 7.9 recidivism for certain programs like our sex offender program which is, which is nationally known and I'm proud to say I was the first officer in 1990 in that program and doing it for 30 years our recidivism rate on a yearly basis is zero to two percent depending on that year that those numbers are unheard of with sex offenders and just so you know uh, people ask me well you get the mamby pamby the easy cases right there on probation uh, a friend of mine uh, in, in Colorado, Kim English, has the research, the criminal justice research programs out there. She did a, a research of all the kinds of situations, all the behaviors, all the crimes that folks commit, and she found that the difference between folks who are in jail, on parole, and probation was this. So people said, well, you know, look at a guy like Jeffrey Dahmer, and oh, he's out there, you don't get him, right? Except Jeffrey Dahmer was on probation prior to being for all the other stuff. So there are lots of different factors that bring a person to different parts of the criminal justice system. And just because someone is on probation doesn't mean that their crimes aren't serious. Their crimes are very serious. Okay. We have had we have sex offenders who have committed crimes with folks, kids as young as two years old, who we find out later on that they 
high bid serial rapists and serial child molesters. We have domestic violence cases who have been doing that kind of violent violence in their interpersonal relationships for years. We have folks who are involved in selling drugs. We have folks who have been involved in selling guns. We have folks who have been to state prison and then on the next charge come to us. So, uh, what brings somebody into the system isn't always, uh, what you see isn't always what you get, and what you see is usually the tip of the iceberg as far as the behavior that someone's gotten into in their lives. Okay. Uh, so, we, we offer that balanced approach, law enforcement and, and prevention and intervention. Uh, we, uh, we have both family, this is what I'm trying to we have both family and criminal court sections. I'm going to talk mostly about the criminal court, but our family court probation department here in Westchester is, in my opinion, and I have nothing to do with it, so I don't have, is the best in the state. Uh, the family court uh, probation section handles over 2,000 kids a year. We do over 10,000 petitions, 2,000 for family offenses, 6,000 for custody and visitation. I don't know if you know that we oversee by contract both secure detention at Woodfield and non-secure detention. Coming next year, we're going to have the uh, unfortunate pleasure of having to deal with raise the age because even though we believe very strongly in the, uh, the way that it's going to be done, no one can answer our questions as to where the money's coming from, what's going to happen, what the courts are going to look like. And it's a little scary, but it's going to happen next year, and we're looking forward to tackling that. Our Commissioner Rocco Posey, since he came in in 89, I, I always kid him that I'm one of his mistakes, I'm one of his first hires. But, so be it. Has always been a, someone who doesn't want to leave well enough alone. Uh, we are highly specialized. Uh, that's part of uh, Commissioner's uh, legacy. We have uh, specialized programs in sex offender work. We have specialized domestic violence programs. We have specialized DWIs programs, youthful offender programs. We have a program called HIU, which deals with gangs and guns. Uh, we have uh, a program that deals with chronic mental illness. Uh, and this is as well as, as all the other types of cases that we have. In probation, the two main functions are supervision and investigations. Uh, we do about 6,000 plus investigations a year of one type or the other. When the criminal courts, uh, when you have somebody go through the criminal court and they're convicted, the judge will generally, uh, with very few exceptions, uh, allowed by law, order pre sentence investigation, and that is a sort of a holistic psychosocial covering everything about that person with an analysis at the end and a recommendation to the court. Um, we usually have between six and 6,300 folks a year that come through our supervision every year as well. Uh, some of those folks come in and out, some finish that year, some start that year in those variety of programs. So we deal with 11 to 12,000 adults a year in one way or the other. Um, okay. So we have four offices, and I put some flyers out there. Uh, unfortunately, our brochure is now so old that it wouldn't be worth it. Uh, White Plains, New Rochelle, Yonkers, Peekskill. Our White Plains office is administration plus, covers everything from White Plains North and West, Fort Chester. Uh, our Yonkers office covers mostly Yonkers, because Yonkers is big enough to have it in the office. Uh, New Rochelle is just family court, and Peekskill, we have a small office in Peekskill that covers the northern uh, sector. We have 157 officers, and we have 24 supervisors, and that's low. Uh, a few years ago, we had uh, a lot of retirements, and we used to have 176 <coughs> officers. I think by next year, because the state is supposedly offering to pay 100%, for the raise the age, we might get back to that, but you know the state could be tricky. When I broke in in 1989, the reimbursement rate was 49 cents on the dollar. It is eight cents on the dollar now. All right, and here's the thing that you got to know: probation is the sentence that is given most in the courts. It's a sentence of choice by the courts. In Westchester County, probation accounts for 80 to 85 percent of all sentences needed out by the court. And actually, the 75 to 85 percent range is true in most of New York. And it is an opportunity for folks to be sentenced, have conditions placed on them that hopefully are not only helpful but protect the community, stay in the community, and try to turn their lives around a little bit. We're not asking anyone to go from, you know, uh, a 
felon to uh, President of the United States in eight years. Uh, that wasn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, for that. But we are. But what we ask for is for folks to find a way, find their own path to leading a more positive uh, lifestyle. Uh, we also have some special programs. You know, one of the obstacles that Commissioner Posey saw when he came on was, are there programs out there for everyone that we have? Are there, are there treatment programs? Are there rehabilitative programs? Are there programs uh, that can really, really, truly help? And what we found was that the programs, Westchester has a lot of programs, but there are a lot of folks doing <coughs> specialized programs. So we have on-site on -site sex offender treatment uh, for 125 sex offenders right now. We have a, an on-site domestic violence program that I'm proud to say is leading the state because it's an actual clinical program. It's, and that's not unheard of in New York. And right now we have eight groups with 108 folks in it and we're building. Uh, and we also, by the way, for you ladies, we have a female domestic violence group as well. And it's quite robust because as we know, 10% of all domestic violence, the woman is the offender. I know it's mostly the men, but there are women offenders too. We can't leave them out of it. We have a polygraph program that works to do clinical polygraphs alongside with our sex offender program. This is state of the art in, in sex offender treatment and, and it's, it's used very well and it's helped a lot of guys break through their denial and really come up with a lot of things to work on. You gotta realize that if a guy comes in for this crime, let's say he had some pornography, child pornography on his computer, he's not gonna tell you if he had 20 real victims. There's nothing in it for him. All right? But we need to know that because if we're gonna help that, that fella get to a better place, understand his processes, put something in the way, we gotta know everything that's going on. And it's not just with sex offenders, same with domestic violence. Same with a guy who comes in because he's got a DWI. He's not gonna tell you that he's been doing meth. You know, he's not, not gonna tell you that unless there's something, an incentive that says, if you tell us this information, you work hard on this, we're gonna, we're gonna try to help you stay in the community, we're trying to help you get ahead. We Ed, have- Ed, can I uh, interrupt you? Sure. If we can, we can I think that a lot of what you're saying could come up in our in our discussion, but because we started a little late. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I can go forever. <laughs> uh, my name is Roger Padetta, and uh, I am the historian for the university. And I think in the first session we had, uh, Brent asked us to give you a sort of introduction of the road we followed to get to this topic. I did a PhD dissertation on the history of Sing Sing, and I published it written on Westchester, the Hudson River, Kingston, and the IBM years, the Tappan Zee Bridge, and the Bank of Rockland County. Uh, and so I'm interested in neighborhood history and the proximity when I taught at Marymount before I went to Florida, uh, to this site uh, really clued me to, to get involved in that. And I worked on the first Sing Sing Museum proposal in 1999, and I was an original member of the Friends. Uh, who now have been a sort of supporting force in creating this museum. Can I have the first one? I think it's the second one. I'd like us to contemplate this. I think the biggest problem that I see in this museum and in all prison museums, I'm presently writing the history of Saints in the 19th century, and I've also been writing and lecturing on a visit museums, which the coincidence of the two things is not surprising. But my engagement with the Sing Sing Museum has made me start to see in the last three or four years how critical the prison museum has become in culture. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and that's the focus of my topics. Just to give you an idea, the interest in this in Europe is enormous. And last summer I spoke at the University of Bologna, um, and again this year um, um, in, in the December of the year, <coughs> Uh, in Europe about this topic. So there's a great deal of interest in the prison museum as topic, separate from this uh, particular incidence of Saints, because people sense something is there and I don't like to explain that. They are us. The goal of the museum, my goal tonight, is to get us to where they go, to who they are, and to break down the biggest obstacle in any museum and in our relationship to issues like mass incarceration, and that is the separation of them from us. 
I know there's evil in them. I don't think that's what this is about. They are humans. And I think that physical separation, and this is why the museums are so critical, uh, is the way in which we have given over uh, to a, a system of mass incarceration. Uh, and I wanted to comment on this. Can I the next slide? Um, Adam Gottnick, running in the New Yorker, said, mass incarceration undermines the 20th century pretensions to humanity. Mass incarceration undermines <coughs> the 20th century pretensions to humanity. It's a very powerful statement. And we need to look at that and to contemplate it. It is the crisis, one of the major crises of our time. The context here is something you may be familiar with called dark tourism. It's a pattern of growing fascination by a middle class increasingly affluent with more time for things that really titillate in new ways. The standard traditional museum doesn't quite do it. So it's the exotic. It's museums of death and suffering that draw millions of people throughout the world. And this museum, even though it's on the soft side of dark tourism, is part of that general category of institutions that seems to attract us. And my argument about this it raises a whole series of new moral issues that you have to look at and that we have to. There are about 150 prison museums in the world. They draw over 3 million people a year. Most people don't even know about single prison museums. So they are a growing force. Um, about a third of uh, all prisons that have closed in the last 25 years to 30 years have become prison museums. So a third of all prisons closed, a third of that third became prison museums. That's a staggering figure. And that's because there's a crisis in the community. We lose the jobs that are done whatever to do with the building. There's a general pattern here. It's very repetitious. Eventually what we do is we turn it into a museum. We sort of restore something. It's a kind of body of justice. The towns suffer because of the affiliation, and now they can produce revenue. Okay. Um, the issue here also is that these prisons and prisons in general, and prisons in particular, are extraordinarily invisible to us. The prison museum really breaks that down. If, if, and I'll suggest that there are issues here, it does that in a way. Curating a prison museum, curating that museum, means the management of those invisibles, those inmates, mm -hmm. those correction officers, those superintendents, the community, the curating of all of those into a whole that gives you a sense of what life on the inside really was like. Uh, do we see the criminal? It's not only the invisibility of the prisoners, but it's the invisibility of the inmate. We think of them as a class, a standard body. They are inmates, they're criminals. We have a hard time of seeing them as individuals, as humans. And what job does the museum, how does the museum address that issue of making them particulars? People with lives, they are us. Uh, how do we know what we know? Someone has suggested that the average American, by the time they vote, will have seen enough media programs about prison or crime that they can get a PhD in the subject. <laughs> now, if you think about that, that's an enormous obstacle because it gives us confidence that we know what we know. I know what to say. I know what this topic is. And it becomes a terrific problem in getting people to see in a way that really is humane and human. Uh, there are models. Uh, the probably the most uh, uh, interesting model, the one most talked about, written about, is Eastern State Penitentiary, which is set, uh, and Dana showed you a slide of that, of the design, different architectural design. Um, and it turned itself into a prison museum. It went through the song and dance over 20 years of what it was going to be, and it finally it settled on this. It's generally the model. And the reason I like it is because I think uh, it's just outside Philadelphia, and it's a rural. Uh, and there's been a lot of discussion between the Philadelphia people uh, and the people here at Sing Sing about things that we have in common and don't have in common. But uh, what's really interesting about this is the feel for architecture, the importance of architecture, and the way in which there was an architectural determinism here, that it's the structure itself that can dictate the pattern and nature of the form, uh, and the, uh, the way in which it's to draw visitors. Easton is very self-conscious about the problems of being a prison museum. More than any prison museum in the world that talks to itself, it keeps asking questions. What's our responsibility? 
And that self-consciousness is quite critical. And I think any good prison museum needs to have it, maintain it, and sustain it. Uh, the big question is how are we going to draw visitors? And when we look at the facade here and we see the gargoyle, uh, we have to pause for me to realize it has nothing to do with the original structure. It's one of the things they put up for the Halloween program. And this is one of their favorite programs. This is called the Night of Terror, in which the prison is opened up on Halloween to the largest number of visitors they have is that night. It sustains, their revenue from that sustains them for the year. But they turn it into a kind of uh, horror house. Ghosts jumping out of cells. And if you talk to them and they're frank about it, they know it's not right. What has it got to do with the history of the prison? Nothing. But what it has to do is generate revenue. And what it does is it tells us every prison museum struggles between a simple issue. Are you going to educate or are you going to entertain? And if you want customers, how do you answer that question? So, uh, Easton does this in many ways. In, one of, in the outside yard, they have two displays demonstrating the rise of, uh, of, of uh, incarceration in the United States. And they also have uh, an example of comparing rates of incarceration in the United States with the rest of the world. That's their commitment to engage with the question of mass incarceration. Uh, and the other best tech ex example we have, we have here is Alcatraz. Uh, Alcatraz is drawing a million and a half visitors a year at $45 a pop. In spite of the fact that the National Park Service really does not want to do this, it does not want to be in the business of a prison museum, and they've made great efforts to turn this into a nature preserve alongside the museum to try to distract you from what the essence of the experience is. Uh, but every, every prison museum in the world has Alcatraz on the brain. It sees the revenues and the source of that. Prisons are laboratories. We need to look at this. How did Sing Sing, and very effectively, I believe, serve as a laboratory, a place where the criminal is defined, examined, studied, and then we began to know the criminal. How? Because they fed us information and knowledge. Knowledge is power. Uh, up the river is really critical here. Uh, the, the question about this is that when we leave New York City, the criminals essentially become uh, separate from their homes and their source of crime. That separation, that physical separation, is the key to the creation of otherness. Otherness is because I don't see you. You know, it's the old mad woman in the attic. I know what it's like because she's upstairs. I don't know what they're like because they're 35 miles away. That separation feeds the otherness. It's a critical element. Uh, and Sing Sing's history is really a uh, part of that. It suffers from that. Uh, and much of what it says, the question for anybody here would be, to find and really to take a hold of all of that kind of material that Dana was talking about and turn that into a narrative. Who writes the narrative? Who is the narrative written for? What stories will be told? What voices will be heard? These are ethical issues which complicate the creation of any prison you see. What do you do with this? Is this a dehumanizing experience? Is this a cell? Is it a cage? Uh, how are the men dehumanized here? Given numbers, uh, treated impersonally, uh, and one or two last comments. These are the records we have. This is the difficulty of finding out who they are. Looking at hard nosed records where you have intake interviews that give you the specific details of their lives. Just a few more. I'm sorry, yes. Sing Sing was the first place we kept the battalion records. The attempt to really physiognomy would tell you who a criminal is, okay? And we were asked to recommend a book, and I recommend In uh, Blood in the Water, Heather Ann Thompson's Pulitzer Prize winning of Attica, which really shows us that in prisons and in the decays and disasters of prisons, we all suffer. Inmates, guards, corrections officers, uh, and, and we suffer. We all suffer from this. This is an idea of what it's going to look like, and I guess the real question here is going to be, the real question here is going to be, uh, can Sing Sing's Prison Museum really meet this challenge? Uh, reform, and again, I want to steal from Adam Gottlieb, reform only happens in response to awakened consciousness. Reform only happens in response to awakened consciousness. Can the Sing Sing Prison Museum awaken our consciousness, make us see 
the history and issue of mass incarceration. In its 200 year history, Sing Sing has incarcerated uh, 100,000 men. They have served half a million years. That's the beginning of mass incarceration. And so how will the museum really help our country? H-O-U-R. It stands for three hours in a child's life. The hour their mother is arrested, the hour that they get to visit their mom at Bedford, at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility or at Taconic um, or in Rikers, um, and the hour in which they come home. So unlike some of the folks that have spoken tonight, we work both with the women on the inside so we work with them within the prisons, and we work with them on the outside. So we are both prison-based and community-based. So we truly believe that love makes the difference. And with that love, in which giving those women the opportunity, they can be <coughs> successful on the outside. We not only know that they can, we see it. So the um, recidivism rate for a woman, as who typically is about 39% in the state of New York. Through our program, it's about 3.5%. We also, our mission and our goal is not only to help these women, but to break the generational recidivism rate. So why do we talk about generational recidivism? It's because if a child doesn't have the confidence and doesn't have the um, love from their mom or doesn't have that ability, they may, in fact, fall into making the same kinds of one-time mistakes. The amount of one-time mistakes that a woman makes that she winds up being incarcerated is extraordinary. So let me just tell you briefly about our location at Bedford Hills. I, for, a, um, for, for four years, was the uh, education supervisor. I did the parenting education classes at um, Bedford Hills. And my office was downstairs in the basement of the school building. Um, uh, and I also did some re-entry work at Taconic, which we are just been asked to help revitalize the Taconic uh, re-entry. So Bedford Hills is a maximum security prison, and now I'm the outreach co coordinator for all of our children. And the maximum security prison sits on Harris Road. And if any of you know Bedford, you know that Harris Road is a very bucolic, beautiful road, and you would miss Bedford Hills Correctional Facility. You would drive right by it. However, there are gates, and there's a whole bunch, and that's one side of the street. On the other side of the street is Takana. In Bedford Hills, our program includes the playroom. I have some pictures over there if you'd like to see from inside. Um, we have a playroom at the back of the prison, of the visiting room, where the women are allowed to play and visit with their children. During the summer, we run something called the summer program. Host families in our community, so we don't do the thus. We, this is us. In fact, it is us. It's our community. The Bedford community is very actively involved in volunteering with us. And so during the summer, the moms are able to, we have host families who host the children, and they take care of them during the day. And we run essentially a, a, a day camp from 9 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon, and they get to spend quality time with their children. We also run nursery. There are approximately 60 women throughout the year that cycle through the nursery. If a woman comes in incarcerated or becomes uh, uh, pregnant, um, she can either be at Rikers or she could be at, Bed at Bedford. And at Bedford is where the majority of state, uh, where they all go after they give birth if they are in the state system. And um, we have the women are able to live with their babies on the unit until they're 12 months old. Um, unless the mother is going to be released within 18 months, in which case she can um, petition to have the baby stay with her. So we have first birthday parties, we have a nursery. Um, and not only do we have a nursery, we have a daycare center. And at the daycare center, the women are required to take both a prenatal class to get onto the nursery unit and to take a parenting class after they leave. Um, other programs that we operate within the facility include parenting education classes. My colleague Renee is here and she's a neighbor uh, here in Yorktown, Shrubby Oaks. She runs the parenting classes. We run everything from foster care and child custody to parenting through art and play. Um, the foster care um, class is taught by a professor at Columbia University who does an inside out class where the students come up and teach the women about their rights and responsibilities of how uh, being incarcerated does not 
is, does not stop you from being a parent. In fact, it enables you to be a parent, and um, the foster care system is required to bring the child to visit. And the women really learn a great deal about how to transform themselves so they can transform their children. We also run a tremendous visitation program where we bring women, uh, the families from around the state, who travel all over the state and bring the children and families for free to come visit their, um, their mom or their child. But we don't stop there. Sister Tisa founded this organization 30 years ago when she was asked by Sister Eileen, who had founded the Children's Center, to um, be a foster parent for several children whose mother was going to be in long-term incarceration. And she took an old convent, along with several sisters of St. Joseph, in Long Island City and um, had the children come live with her. And in this compassionate care, she decided to name this convent my mother's house. And why did she do that? She did that because when the children went to school and someone said, where is your mother? They said, and where do you live? They said, I live at my mother's house. So that they did not have to explain where their child lives, or where their mother lives. In addition, so as she did this, Sister Tisa, who was a principal at a school before she was founder and our dynamic, our dynamic and inspirational leader, um, she organically grew things to help the women and whatever they needed. We have a training program. It's called Our Working Women. We are actually um, supported through um, lots of grants, lots of foundations, but we work with Edgemont. So Edgemont is a work release program. So a mom can come to us, stay with us. They're still within the prison system. They're still within their sentence, but they stay with us because they have their baby or their child with us, or even if they're being reunited with their child and they go and get their job and they still report to Edgemont. We have a daycare center. We have an after school program. We have a um, food pantry that not only feeds our families, but also feeds the um, community of Long Island City. We also house about 70 women that out in Long Island City and their children. We have everything from my mother's house where they live when they first get out in a sort of communal area where they learn to cook, where they have support, where they're required to live in a community again, to housing that's scaled up as they get their jobs. We have cooperations with organizations like Con Edison and who help give jobs to these women once they're trained. And now we're working on a brand new exciting project. We've just bought a new building and we are going to be to call it the learning building. So we're going to have our teen and pre our teen program there. We're going to have programs that the entire community can use to um, to uh, to have a space. So it's not just going to be for our women. It's going to be for the people in Long Island City. In addition, I I think that the things that I can tell you that I've witnessed in my four years inside, um, although. Being a member of St. Patrick's Church, I have been giving to the prison because we run a holiday program where our entire community is bringing gifts. We set up a room downstairs, and the moms can come in and pick a gift for their kids. When the moms, when the kids come to visit, notice they're moms to me. They're not inmates. These are very real people. We give them the resources. They're doing the hard work. Yesterday we had a wonderful program. And I think I was most touched by several of the women when they were talking about their experience. And one of them has a child who she had on the outside and that she did not parent so well, her first child. She was incarcerated, as she put it, and made a bad choice. And she was not having the best relationship with her child. But due to our program, she has a wonderful relationship with her child. To Tawana, that's her name, she um, is so, going to be leaving within a couple of years, and she's excited to go home. But not only is she excited to go home, she's excited to go home because she's going to be able to see her child every day for the relationship that she has with her daughter that she does not have with her son. And it's because of our programming and because of the hard work that she's done. So I want to thank the Westchester Library System for getting us involved in this conversation. So often this mass incarceration discussion 
or the discussion of the thus is them is an academic discussion or it's a discussion that's happening within the justice system or for folks who are really passionate about social justice. It's not happening in communities and it needs to happen in communities because one in 25 children in America have an incarcerated parent. That means one child in every classroom has an incarcerated parent. And if you think it's not happening in Westchester County, it is. If you go into a, a community of color, it's something like five children in a classroom will have an incarcerated parent. So how can we have these discussions with our children as well? And here I'll give you a book. My children grew up in the Bedford Village Library. They read voraciously as a result they have lots of questions and their world is much open. There's a beautiful book called Ruby on the Outside. It's written by Nora Baskin. She is a local writer, she's in Connecticut, and she wrote the story about a young child whose name is Ruby, and Ruby's mother is incarcerated for a violent crime, and she goes to visit her, and it's the story of what this child is thinking, and it's the story about how we, as a community, can work with that child to understand that child, and how that child is learning with a mother with a 25-year sentence to still have her mom, to still be herself. And someday, her mom, who is 25 years old, who has got a 25-year prison sentence, she's going to be about back in that community and having that relationship with her mother and having that relationship with people who come and visit will make her much more successful when she returns to the community. So our work, I welcome any of you to donate to our programs, to visit us, to visit us, to help us. I have information there. I'll be here if you have any questions. Thank you for being involved. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm Barbara Lambros. I'm the Westchester County Reentry Coordinator. The way I got involved in this is my background is vocational rehabilitation from way back when. And uh, I have worked with individuals with different kinds of disabilities, mental health, physical, learning disabilities. And the goal was always to get individuals to employment, to fulfilling lives. So when I had uh, eventually moved over to work for the county, that's where the merge of mental health and forensic really was highlighted. And my role with the county had quickly metamorphosed into something that I had never intended to, never gave any thought to, to work in. And that was working with individuals with severe and persistent mental health issues being released from state prisons. And this was back in, I want to say, 2002. And the numbers were just increasing ever, ever more. The uh, correctional facilities had instituted more OMH programs, Office of Mental Health licensed programs in the correctional facilities because they were recognizing that people with severe mental health issues were falling through the cracks. They were not getting mental health treatment. Once the, the OMH programs <coughs> had come on board, that's where they really had gotten, they really started to address individuals. So now these folks are coming back into the communities, needing support, needing connection to services, needing discharge planning. Um, now, when you're working with state prisons, they're, they're statewide. So if somebody has ties to, um, for, to a specific county, and in our case, Westchester County, you have a, a uh, pre-release coordinator that is on the border of Canada. They don't know necessarily what services are in Westchester County. So somebody in my role would help facilitate the, the best plan for somebody returning to live in Yonkers, for somebody who, returning to live in Ossining, um, knowing the clinics and all that. So from there, in 2006, the Department of Criminal Justice Services, under the guidance of Governor Cuomo, had proposed to several counties the reentry task forces. And the purpose of the reentry task forces was community safety and to help facilitate reintegration of individuals that are being released from state prisons back into the communities and to reduce the recidivism rate of those that are returning. So each year, 
25,000 individuals are being released from New York State prisons. Out of those, within three years, 40% had been returning to prison, which is, it was just staggering numbers. Um, so the part of the reason that we see such high numbers is somebody who's going to state prison, they have a minimum of a year sentence. Usually it's much longer than that. We see people uh, incarcerated for 15 years, 20 years, even five years. Somebody who's now coming back to a community, their, their situation has changed dramatically. The longer they're removed, the more things have changed. Subway tokens, now we have metro cards. Beepers, cell phones, smartphones, everything becomes more complicated. Phone books, everything is now internet based. If you don't have the skills, if you don't know how to maneuver any of this, the world is very complicated. Then you put on certain issues such as mental health issues, now it becomes even more difficult. You put on substance abuse issues, even more difficult. Medical issues, how do you negotiate this if you have no familial connections maintained anymore, if you don't have any um, exposure to any of these, these changes. So the task forces were created. Um, it started off with, uh, we started off with eight task forces. Now we have 20 throughout New York State. Um, I, I have a handout and I'll pass it around of which counties um, in New York have, have the task forces. And the goal of the task force is to really identify <coughs> gaps in service, which there's tremendous service gaps, as you could imagine, um, and to work to create programs that would help individuals be successful in the community, to identify individuals' needs. So we work one-on-one -on -one with people just to see what it is that we can do to help each person be as successful as possible. Uh, the grant is, it's a grant-based program funded by the Division of Criminal Justice Services and we are co-chaired in Westchester County by the Department of Community Mental Health, by the District Attorney's Office and by DOCS, which stands for Division of, I'm sorry, D Department of Corrections and Supervision. It used to be parole and uh, correctional facilities and they've merged. So. We have a nice balance of law enforcement and social services. Um, our key stakeholders in the grants are the uh, Department of Social Services, um, which has the one-stop employment centers to help with employment issues, training. Um, let me just take a little peek. Mm -hmm. um, Access, I don't know if people are familiar with Access. Access is a state-funded um, agency for individuals with a diagnosed disability where they offer training. So that's one of training and vocational services and assessments for somebody who may be struggling and not really clear with what they're, why they're struggling. So they, they would help to identify if somebody has severe learning disabilities, um, borderline intellectual functioning, and then from there, a plan is put in place for these individuals. And a lot of folks that go into the prison system aren't always aware that they have, why, why they've been struggling most of their lives. And we do connect them with those services that will give them the support to be successful. Um, we also work very closely with the Department of Corrections, uh, the Department of Public Safety, the White Plains Police Department, Yonkers Police Department, and Again, the goal is, is to really get people connected to the services so this way we can reduce the recidivism rate. Um, one of the things that has changed throughout the years with the focus of reform and rehabilitation is cognitive-based programming because a lot of individuals, um, the, the goal is to work with individuals to help them realize what had gotten them into this situation that they're in. So um, we do work with programs that do offer cognitive-based programming. Um, we incorporate it in with uh, anger management, which is some certain programs that are required by an individual who's under parole supervision. Um, also, we want to we want people who have not had employment skills, we want to work with them so this way they are 
employment ready. So we do connect them with programs that are pre-vocational, that are giving them the skills that they may not have to be successful in the workforce in addition to getting them into specific vocational training programs so they have certification so they could end up in positions and jobs where they can be financially self-sustaining self um, and also be able to reconnect and support with their and support their families. So eligibility for working with the task force, we exclusively work with individuals that are under parole supervision. And the office that we work predominantly with is the one in New Rochelle. So most of the individuals that we're working with are returning to Yonkers, Mount Vernon, um, Greenberg, White Plains, um, and we work hand in hand with the parole officers. So whatever their conditions of parole are, we're working with them to help them meet those conditions. If somebody violates their conditions of parole, that's one of the big reasons that they do go back into the prison system based on a technical violation. So the, uh, the other things that we do with them, when somebody comes out of prison, they are released with approximately $40 in their pocket. They're released with a prison ID, um, which is good for 90, uh, well, it was 90 days. The state increased it to 120 <coughs> days. Hopefully, they're being released with a social security card. Hopefully, they're being released with a birth certificate. And it, the state has come up with a, a system where they, individuals who are being released from the state prison system can go to the DMV offices with their prison ID, with their release papers, and exchange that for a New York State ID card. They would have to pay the $10 fee, which is prohibitive for somebody that is walking out with $40. That's already a quarter of what the, the money that they have. So one of the things we do as a task force is we <coughs> work with them to get all of their identifications. One of the first things we do upon intake with an individual is to see exactly what IDs they have because we want everybody to have proper IDs. We don't want them to continue to use a prison state ID. It's stigmatizing. It's not helping them reintegrate successfully. So we, uh, if they do not have a birth certificate, we give them the funds to, do, to go to uh, get that, we'll help them fill out the application. If they're in New York City, if, if uh, we'll do it online with them. If it's one of the local jurisdictions, again, we'll, we'll assist them with that. The next step is to make sure they have a social security card. You can't get a job on the books without a social security card. So again, we work with them to make sure they have that ID in hand. With those, then they can go to DMV and we'll give them the $10 money order to help get that in place. Then the next step is, do, do we have any mental health issues that we need to address? Because if somebody has uh, issues that are not being addressed, think they're not going to be successful for too long. We're going to start to see them become symptomatic. That's not beneficial. Same thing with substance abuse and medical issues. We're looking to connect them to those for those supports. After that, once, we're, once we know that they're successfully covered in those areas, then the next step is education and employment. Do you have a GED? If not, we're going to work with you to get you connected to a provider that is exceptionally good at working with individuals with maybe one-on-one -on -one tutoring if that's what somebody needs. If somebody is just ready to take the test, we're going to encourage them to do that because having the education, having an education with a GED and hopefully move them up further is something that's going to help them be even more successful in the community and help them stay home and not recidivate. Um, same thing with vocational. If somebody has no skills, again, we want to make sure that they have skills. So we, we have partnered with a lot of agencies in Westchester that do offer vocational training in Havoc, in um, OSHA, in whatever an individual has the aptitude for, the interest for, we're looking to connect them to that. Um, then the next step is housing. Housing is a tough one because in Westchester County, the, the rents are sky high. Um, everywhere they're sky high. So this, this is a challenge that all the task forces are faced with 
we all are. So we're always, again, looking to partner with agencies that are the experts in locating, uh, working with landlords that will work with somebody with a felony offense, um, that will work with DSS with the, with the rental assistance that they will provide, um, whatever we can do to help, to help um, ease, the, ease uh, the red tape and cut through all the barriers is what we're looking to do for success. Okay, so that's the end of the We, uh, I think you can tell we have a lot of expertise here and a lot of passion and, and energy. And so I'm going to invite you, uh, and, and fortunately our, our, the head of the library said we can, because we got started a little late, we can, we can continue past quitting time. So the floor is yours. We have the experts. Yes, sir. Question. What is the qualifications to be a probation officer? Do you have to have physical or uh, social degrees? You have to have a bachelor's degree minimum and 36 hours in behavioral sciences of psychology. We have folks who come from all over. I have a special ed degree. I got into this this way. We have lawyers who decided they didn't want to be lawyers anymore, probation officers. We have a lot of different people. So reasonably high, highly educated workforce. It wouldn't be a step up from a prison guard, I guess. Uh, it's not the same system. Yes, ma'am. Is there an age card? An age requirement? Uh, no. I mean, well, there's no cap. Well, the the thing is, no, there's no cap. Uh, and the thing is, if you have generally, unless you're a savant, if you have to have a, a bachelor's degree, you're at least 22 years old. We're trying to get into. We we have a lot of interns. I'm welcoming interns because one of the things that's tough to do, especially with the civil service system, is to recruit. Because not only when you go to recruit, you say, hey, this is a great job to get interested. Now they got to wait for the civil service test. they got to wait for the list to come out. It's a necessary thing, but uh, it gets tough. But there's no, we have uh, one officer right now who's 71, and she does more field work than a lot of our other officers. Yes, ma'am. Um, I want to know, if you, have you ever dealt with anyone that has been found guilty and <laughs> Have I ever had anyone who's using the mic? Oh, I don't, I don't think it works. It works, does it? Yeah. Uh, I've had someone that I had to uh, let, let go to Nevada because he was about to get killed, but he wasn't in the witness protection. <laughs> and just one more question. What's the greatest number of um, type of crime that women have committed? Well, you know what? I, 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 speaking out of school, uh, I would probably say that the two greatest types of crimes that, that we have that women have committed are probably DWI and drug-related crimes. Again, that's what we have them for. Let, not to get on a soapbox, but let, let me just say one thing. The, the, the one overriding factor, the common denominator that now has been supported by research in most of uh, uh, folks who get involved with the law and, and, and are in legal trouble is a history of trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, about 80 to 85 percent of everyone in the legal system has a meaningful history of trauma, usually childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. We heard that at one of, uh, one of our other <laughs> programs. Yes, Abby. So, and you made a, a comment about the fact that most of the people that are in your probation system um, really represent the same sort of demographics and, and uh, committed the same uh, types of crimes as the people who were incarcerated. Question, if you look at those two populations and the percentage that commit a second crime, mm -hmm. how do those statistics compare? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I will tell you one of, uh, there are some basic differences for uh, for example, if you're a person of color, uh, the, the state pr uh, prison system usually is about 85 to 87 percent. It's broken down a little different in probation. It's like 40, 40, 20. So that was there, my other question. there's one. I, I knew it. I just knew it. Uh, but as far as the next crime that's committed, uh, I, I really can't answer that question. Maybe. In uh, reentry, because we deal exclusively with individuals under parole supervision, we'll work with individuals that may have been under probation supervision 
when they were younger in their lifetime and then they committed another crime, they may have had another term of probation, but usually after that, then they're in our system, mm -hmm. then they're in the state system, and now they're getting longer sentences. So I, I have a question, um, and I guess more for, for Barbara and a little bit um, for Donna too. You talked about the resources that are available to those who are released from prison. Um, I would imagine there aren't enough resources for um, all that needed, mm -hmm. and that there are challenges getting them, for getting individuals to those resources. Mm -hmm. Can you talk just a little mm -hmm. bit about that and how, as a community, we might be able to um, be of help if at all? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, there definitely are not never enough resources, and then the more. Um, budget cuts that we get, that, be, that presents an even greater challenge. So always, we're always looking to reach out to agencies to create programs that would address the needs of individuals. Um, so that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is how you get an individual to get to these programs. There's a lot of, there's a lot of real, real logistical issues that impact somebody from following through. One of, it, one of them and one of the main ones is finances. If somebody has, is unemployed, is looking for work, is not successful yet at finding work, has a family, has children, or is in the shelter system, it's a problem. $2.75 to get to a program one way, same thing to get home. That, that is a big factor in somebody not following through. We provide individuals with round trip metro cards. That's part of the budget that I have allocated to help individuals with that. Um, and we'll continue to do that. We're, we're not just giving out metro cards, they're very specific. If somebody has to go to DSS, we'll give them a round trip metro card. If somebody has an intake appointment at a treatment program, we'll give them a metro card. If they have a job interview, we'll give them that. Even somebody who's starting employment, just because you get a job today doesn't mean you've got the money to get to, to, get to work until you get your first paycheck. So we'll continue to support them with that. So I think one of the other issues, as you said, was housing. And so that's part of the reason that our children is growing. In fact, one of the newest things that we've started to do is so mostly we take women and their children, but there are now some women who are getting out after 25 years who have no children, who have no place to go. And so we have taken some women now who have uh, will get the housing so that we can then support them with the rest of what they're doing. And in fact, we are looking to purchase something. We're in the process of looking in the Upper Westchester, Lower Westchester area because there is a real issue with housing um, in that area, in this Upper Westchester area as well as in sort of the Peekskill <laughs> area. Osborne and the Fortune Society um, are organizations in, who are working in Westchester County very hard to find the housing because if you don't have housing, you wind up leaving and going into a shelter. And when you're going into a shelter system, you don't have security. And so it's harder for you to deal with the rest of your life, which includes getting that job or following up with your parole or doing these other things. Um, so that, that is part of it. And giving that structure, which is one of the things that our children does, I mean, we sort of give a calendar to the women. You have to go to parole. You have to do those who have parole. Some of them don't. Um, we give them you know, the, the foundation to you know, get uh, go in and get some new clothing so they can go for that interview. So that's why these other programs are important because for those women who, or those men who don't have it, they need that structure to help get them going. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming. 42% uh, return to prison for parole violations. I'm assuming there's no underlying crime committed also. Is it any pre-screening before a prisoner gets parole so the parole program could be more successful? Or is it just a matter of he slays so much of his line and he automatically gets parole? Uh, in, what would happen is somebody is given a sentence and when they are eligible for parole, they do go before a parole board. And at that point, a lot, a lot is reviewed. 
their time while they were incarcerated, if they were somebody who followed through with programs, if they were somebody who had no behavioral issues. When you're incarcerated at, at the state level, um, if somebody you, if somebody breaks the law while they're incarcerated, they're issued tickets, mm -hmm. and they're called tier tickets depending on the severity. All of that is reviewed. Um, so yes, there, there is a process. Not everybody is, is released. The remorse for the crime that was committed, um, the parole board's determination of how much the person rehabilitated while they were incarcerated, if they took advantage of vocational programs, educational programs, while they were incarcerated, that's all reviewed. And then in, in, uh, to comment on the 40% that do return to the state prison system, that is a combination of technical violations where they did not follow through with their conditions of parole. Anybody that's paroled um, to, to any counties, any states, they are still serving out their sentence, but now in the community, and that's why they have to adhere to certain conditions because as you satisfy those conditions, you are now proving that you're um, rehabilitating and staying in the community. So it's a combination of technical, and then there are, there are instances where new crimes are committed and somebody is, is violated. So somebody could commit a, a robbery, a burglary. A lot of times we, we um, see substance, mm -hmm. either, either criminal sale of controlled substances, uh, criminal use, um, possession, and that would get somebody to go back again. A brief follow-up on that. Does the parole board have any input into the correction system mm -hmm. to help at the synergistically to improve the parole system? Well, I think that's why uh, a part of the reason why instead of having the uh, Department of Corrections as one entity, and the division of New York State Division of Parole as a separate entity, they are now a, a combined unit. So it's th their their view is that rehabilitation and reentry starts when the person is first incarcerated, and they're working you know, towards. You, you should have a good profile on who becomes a successful parolee. Uh, you know what? You you can look and see how well if if somebody had. Um, committed a lot of violations while they were incarcerated, if they were found with contraband well, fighting. So mm -hmm. that may be somebody that you'd say, well, they're challenging authority while they're incarcerated. How how well are they going to accept authority outside of the prison yeah, system? Well, I mean, there's, there's no... A simple thing would be like a good support system on its own outside. That's, that's tremendous. Like that. yeah. Well, there are some states, like the, the state of Vermont has a mentoring system mm -hmm. that they use, and I had a, a chance to see it in action because I did a lot of sex offender work. So what happens is, as a person gets ready to come out, they have three, four, five folks in the community who are trained, who know this person, who have met this person, mm -hmm. who are willing to be sort of good bystanders and, and help them out. And it, that's something that perhaps New York can look at a little bit more, mm -hmm. that kind of mentor system. I know that the agencies are trying to do that as much as possible, but it's really a community job. Yeah. And really, supervision, making sure that folks who stay on the straight and narrow is really all of our responsibilities. We have a few more minutes. And uh, Ms. Yeah, I have a question. With the women from Bedford, it seems they have transitional housing. Is there anything set up for the men yeah, similar to that? So they would have a unit of housing to go to, there would be camaraderie and counseling, and then from there they could go to whatever uh, there is. <coughs> So our program is, so we hold the contract for the state to do the work yes. that we do inside Bedford yes. and inside Taconic and the stuff that we do at Rikers. Yes. The stuff that we do outside in Long Island City is completely done by the organization. We're not, we don't have money from the state. I mean, we have some money for the state. The no, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm going to come back. I mean, that's why I'm, I'm answering the question. Um, so the, the, um, so the, what we do in Long Island City has no state funding. Uh, well, it has limited. I mean, there's money. Th um, there's money for some of the when we build the housing, and there's some money for the training programs that comes through state. We do a lot of private fundraising. There are programs for the men. Things like Osborne, 
things like the Fortune Society. There are programs that work with them. There are programs that they go in and try to work with some of the people. But I think that what happens, and I think what we're talking about here, is that those are the motivated um, folks. They find, they, they have worked through their incarceration. They have taken advantage of the programs. We've seen that. So those people are more likely to be successful, which is why you see some of our positive numbers, that if you speak to me or you speak to someone from Osborne or you speak to someone from Fortune Society, you'll see that our numbers and our success rate is higher because we've got those things in place. When you talk to these folks who are dealing with parole where they may not have the support in the community or they have not accessed the programs, um, that's where you're seeing the recidivism rate so high. And we do have mentoring situations where we do have people who mentor the women. Same thing at Osborne, same thing at Fortune, same at some of these other organizations. But you know, these folks are doing the harder work in some ways because they're doing it with the folks who haven't um, taken the time to reflect, haven't taken the time to use the programs within the facilities, of which New York State is really a model in the sense that we do have the programs if you will access them. And, and sure. actually, in one of our other conversations that we've had at other libraries, one of the panelists have brought up that while there are these services that are available, they've often had to wait a very long time to access Absolutely. those services because they're just as not enough. To what, to right. Access. They have to wait to access the services. And also, it takes an extraordinary amount of time for some, uh, because of the trauma that they that most offenders have experienced, as we spoke of, they have to come to terms with that trauma. So if you have a four-year sentence, let's say, right, for some kind of drug issue, and you've not accessed some of these things, you haven't dealt with that trauma. And so as a result, you're going to go out, you're going to be on parole, and you're going to wind up back inside. But if you have accessed some of those trauma issues, and this is stuff that we do with our nursery mothers. I mean, this is stuff that we do. I mean, it's part of what we do. If that woman is starting to deal with the trauma that she faced as she was growing up, or the trauma that he faced, they're going to do much better as the programs, or, or they do them through various programs, RTA and Sing Sing. If a person is out there acting, and they're doing something, and they're learning about it, they're learning about themselves, and they're starting to work through that. Yes, sir. Are you Yes, uh, we're talking about New York here, but uh, and you said about four uh, percent are incarcerated. Uh, how does this compare with other states? Oh, I don't know the answer to that question. I think I'm going to have to look that up. I'm going to have to figure that out. I'm going to actually venture a guess to say that we probably have a higher incarceration rate in New York State than some other states. The, the Vera Institute actually just um, released a web-based map of the country with the density of the population and you can go into any uh, state or any county and actually look at precisely the answer to that question. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah, it is. And very interactive. Do you know the answer? No, because the, the, uh, it's on that website. That's on that website. Conversations. That was yeah. the so now I'm going to go look at the website and get that number so I have the answer next time. <laughs> you would expect any state that has urban areas right. like New York City, like right. LA, to be higher. To be higher, absolutely. Roger. I, I, I just wanted to say I was fascinated listening to Barbara's comments um, and thinking of the intervention she was talking about once the label of convict uh -huh. had been fixed. And the difficulty we're going to have in society uh, front-loading those interventions before that happened. Mm -hmm. I think one of the goals I thought of our conversations was to radically rethink mm -hmm. what has clear to me been a broken institution for a very, very long time. My view of parole, which I think is a wonderful effort, is really an attempt to fix a broken system. And I think if you begin to look at it that way, then what needs to come onto the table is alternatives to this. Uh, Yogi Berra said, uh, I have deja vu all over again. That's how I would describe my study of penal history. You think again? I think in 1934, they were proposing that every inmate at Sing Sing uh, really make sure they had at least a high school education. 
1934. 1898, they lost the textbook contract they had for the state of New York, and they had piles of school books in the prison storeroom. And nobody said, what about using it for the prisoners? Mm -hmm. And they had produced and published and made those textbooks. Mm -hmm. So I think I would like to make a plea for a much more radical review of what the system has been. And again, as a historian, I'm absolutely fascinated by its incredible persistence. And what does that say about yeah. us? I, w I, was, I would, if you'll permit me the, the last word, uh, but we can keep talking uh, among ourselves for, for a long time. I think the connection between Dana's program and the history and what we've heard today is a lot has changed, but a lot has not changed. 200 years, and I feel like some of the same issues that de Tocqueville talked about in 1831, we're still talking about today. And that's, that's food for thought. And one link that I would like to make is you heard them mention the Osborne Association. Well, the Osborne Association is named for Thomas Ma Osborne, the, the man Dana described in her, uh, in her presentation. That, that association goes back to the 1930s. So there have been a lot of groups, you've heard of, about a few of them, uh, that have been working at this for a long time, and then there are some newer groups that have formed that are working on these, on these issues. And so we've just scratched the surface at this program and the other programs that the libraries have hosted. We hope this is the beginning and not the end of, uh, of conversations, and we're very pleased that the Sing Sing Prison Museum has been able to join the uh, Westchester Library uh, system and the Westchester uh, Community Foundation in, in launching these community conversations. Please join me in thanking our panel.